loves you. God loves you. So, all right, y'all ready for the word today? Yeah. All right, I wonder uh, uh, what, what, what were the guesses on what was going to be taught today? Did y'all actually have something? I did. Yeah, what, what was it? Man, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did you, did you it, know insight onto any of that? Wow, okay, all right. He said a word that's actually part of my title, so that's crazy. But it wasn't just all about that, but that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Okay, that was pretty good. I'm, I'm going to get to it here in a second. Really, what I'm going to be talking about when Pastor asked me to, to teach, you know, sometimes, because he did a standalone message last week, right? And then before that, what was the series that we were in? House and Order. Boy, that took that five of you got it after a little bit. Holy cow. We were on it for like all year. House and Order. And when he said, you know, just teach what's on your heart, you know what's on my heart? What's on my heart is what I've been fed in the place that God has placed me. So you know what's on my heart? My, an order. How my house in order. Me having my life in order. You know what's also on my heart? Uh, getting my words to work for me, what I've been hearing every Wednesday night since I've been here. That's what's in my heart. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning, uh, is we're going to c- kind of continue. It's not really continuing on that series, but it's, it's really going to be recapping just some of that stuff and talking about how we were having a, uh, I think this was earlier in December, where Pastor had actually talked about he's going to be doing this series about ha- getting our house in order. And we were talking about vision for 2024 and uh, words like order and excellence and accountability, uh, fun words like that came up. And so, you know, everyone was going around just saying, hey, what, what about the vision for your area? What about this next year? And one of the things when we're talking about order, one of the things that came to me is this. Order is a prerequisite for progress, right? If you want to make progress in your life, guess what has to be in place? Order. There is no progress that you'll be making unless things are in order. And so that, that was kind of a word that came out. And the title of this morning's message is basically that same thing. But, you know, titles of messages are better when they either rhyme or there's alliteration. And I'm an alliteration guy. So here's the title for this morning. It is Progress Demands Priorities. I know D is, doesn't start with, demand doesn't start with a P. But you got two Ps there. Progress Demands Priorities. Priorities. So I know you're excited about that, right? Okay. I love preaching to four people. It's amazing. I'll tell you what. I mean, we're going to be engaged and going with these four this morning. Y'all, got, y'all are going to have to talk back a little bit. Church is an interactive uh, thing. It's an interactive thing. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not here to tickle your ears with anything. I don't have anything good to say to you. I'm going to read the Bible to you. And it would do you good for your face to look like, wow, he's reading the words of Jesus. These are pretty important. Yes. Amen. That's right. Man, so participate. Engage yourself this morning. Engage your heart uh, with the word. Um, one of the things that, that really, ha- why this series really spoke to me and is still speaking to me is that how many of you, you, you just have those days or you have those weeks? Uh, God forbid you have those months where it's just like, what is, ha- what is going on in my life? What am I doing with my life? Well, I saw some hands raised right there. More, y'all are more, this will be good for y'all today. Okay. But I'm like, you're at home and the kids are fighting about the dumbest things, right? And, and they just, they're just snapping at each other. And guess what happens to mom and dad? They start snapping at the kids and they start snapping at each other. And the, the pets are doing something stupid and and you walk in the laundry room, and none of this is real. The clothes are piled all the way to the ceiling on the little counter there. They're clean. They just need to be folded, right? I can clean clothes all day. In the washer, in the dryer, throw them on the counter. That's where they're at, right? People just go and dig in. They dig out the clean clothes they like, right? Dishwasher, like, is this real? The dishes, they have dishes, they're, they're always in the sink. I don't understand. They're in the sink. They're in the dishwasher, too. I don't know what's clean or what's dirty. You know what I'm talking about? You just find there's just stuff everywhere. Somehow we've got 47 vacuums at our house, and they're all sitting out. I'm like, why is that vacuum sitting out? Well, I, was gonna, I wasn't done using it. it was, you used it three days ago. It's been there for three days. 
And I'm like, you walk around your house, you walk around, you just see things are out of order, right? Sometimes you're like, you open the pantry, there's nothing in here. We got no food, we got no money, our pet's heads are falling off. It's that, it's that type of week. That's a dumb and dumber reference for those of you who need to educate yourself, all right? You got some homework today. But have you ever had those times where your pet's heads are falling off? It's just like, what is going on in life right now? And what happens is it's so frustrating, and we can kind of uh, just uh, recede back into uh, really what we do is that we like to veg, and we like to try to comfort ourselves during those times and check out. And that's the opposite of what you need to do during that time. It's so frustrating when things like that, and you know what? It's just out of order. You can, you can see there is no priority in my life right now. I've not given God a priority in my life, and other things are just, they're just going all over the place. And that's what happens. That's what happens. So uh, this has really been speaking to me, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it today. So I hope it helps you. Um, let's look at James chapter 3. No, um, hold on. Let's put up 2 Timothy 3 first. This is, a good, this is a good scripture. I just want to read this. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Somebody say this with me. Say, all scripture, all scripture is God-breathed. Is God-breathed. That means all of it. All scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. All right, so God's word is useful for a lot of things, right? Some of these things you don't like to hear. I don't want to be rebuked and corrected and trained. Teaching, sometimes you can teach me. This is what God's word is useful for. It's useful to teach me. It's you, you know what would be the best thing that can happen for us today sitting here? We would be corrected. Man, I love, you, you don't love when you get corrected when it comes, you know, with the swat behind it, right? <laughs> Growing up, you're like, all right, I'm going to correct. But, you know, that's the best thing because you're going the wrong way. And someone loves you enough to say, no, that's the wrong way, and that's, that path's going to end in destruction. Here's some correction. Here's what God's Word says. It's, it's useful for training in righteousness. God's Word. Hey, go ahead to verse 17. Here's why. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Man, I want to be equipped for all that God's called me to do. So as we go through the Word today, let's remember this is what it's used for, and this is what it's going to do for us. Amen. Amen. All right. Progress demands priorities. Um, so I'm going to pick up. Oh, I do have a few little jokes for you. I know I like to, to how many of you were like, oh, man, he's not going to tell any jokes. Two, three, a couple of you. Well, all right. Here's for you. I don't really have any jokes. Really what happened is Courtney got me uh, this Chuck Norris desk calendar for Christmas. You know, that used to be a thing like the, all the Chuck Norris stuff. Apparently, it's still going. They're making calendars and everything now. But here's a few of my favorites from the year so more, uh, or from the year so far. Uh, this last one, I think it was on Friday, it said, Chuck Norris doesn't mow his lawn. He dares it to grow. <laughs> you, why don't you try that? He just dares his grass to grow. Uh, I think this is my favorite one so far. It said, Chuck Norris can pick oranges from an apple tree and make the best lemonade you've ever tasted. <laughs> Oh, Chuck Norris can clap with one hand. Mm, you try that today. And then uh, this last one, Chuck Norris can punch a cyclops right between the eye. <laughs> it's just funny. That's good. Chuck Norris, he's awesome. Okay. He's not Jesus, though. He's no Jesus. All right. So uh, let's get into James chapter 3. And this is where we're going to start. So this is going to be a lot of what you've heard of the last couple of weeks. But how many of you know that's a good thing? When we're talking about teaching and training, that stuff doesn't happen because you heard it one time. You know, I could have come up here and preached some off-the-wall message that we haven't been talking about at all, and I'm not sure how good that would do us because just getting the next best revelation doesn't do you any good if there's no foundation in your life, right? And so I'd rather work a little longer, stay a little longer on the foundation and building and talking about the basics, the fundamentals, the principles. Jesus talks about this, right? He's like, if you, if you listen to what I say, but you don't put them into practice, you're like someone who just builds their house on the sand. Guess what happens then? When things come, it, it's like you weren't building anything that was going to last ever. 
So it's important for us to build on the right foundation and to keep building on it. So we're going to be talking about the first, the first thing when we're talking about priority in our life is this right here, order. Order begins where there is submission to authority. This is really important because if you want order in your life, that order has to come from the right place, okay? You can't just determine what you think the order should be for your life. So this order comes from somewhere, and it starts with submission to authority. So in James chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. So selfish ambition. What I see here, if selfish ambition is there, I'm going to find disorder and evil of every kind. What is selfish ambition? It's just selfishness. It's my way. It's what I think. It's, it's I'm, I'm doing it myself. This is me. Selfish, self-absorbed. Guess what that leads to? Disorder. It leads to disorder, and disorder leads to evil of every kind. That's not something I want a part of. So, on the contrary, if, if it's not selfish ambition, if it's not my way, but rather it's his way, what will that lead to? That will lead to order and structure for my life and for my days, right? Um, let's look at Proverbs chapter 14. We're going to look at verses 12 and 14. It says, there is a way that seems right to a man. So there's a way that I think I could order my life. It seems right, but here's what happens. Its end is the way of death, not what I want. So what I seem, what I think, my way, this is the end that it leads to right here. Check this out in in, uh, verse 14. Two verses later, he says, that is, oh, okay. Go back to that. That was funny. It said mirth. Even in laughter, the heart may sorrow, and the end of mirth may be grief. I don't even know what that means, but <laughs> mirth, anybody? No? I know of, what was the, the thing they brought, Jesus? Myrrh. Myrrh. Yeah, not mirth. So, uh, <laughs> all right, verse 14. All scripture, I don't know what mirth is, but it's God-breathed, all right? <laughs> It's useful for something, and we've got to dig in and find out what, all right? Here's what verse 14 says. The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but where will a good man be satisfied from? Above. He will, be, he, he will have himself placed under the Lord, the authority, and he will be satisfied from above. Satisfied from above. Amen. This is good. This is good. Uh, let's go to uh, James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 7. Again, this is just really more review. It says, so humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What we're talking about is we're talking about submitting to authority, submission to authority right now. This is the start of ordering your life right here. All right? So who is supposed to humble you? You are. I'm to humble myself. I'm to humble myself, and then... I can resist the devil, and he will flee. You know, uh, Pastor Nate said it this way a few weeks ago. He said, God over me puts Satan under me. But God not over me puts Satan over me. Boy, that's not a place that we want to be where the devil is over us and the things that are happening in our life, he's just got free reign to do whatever he wants in our life. And so it's important that we are fully submitted to God. And when we're talking about under, you think about being an umbrella like an umbrella over you. Like being half out of the umbrella is not doing you a whole lot of good. Like being under means being fully under, all the way under, all the way submitted to the Lord. Amen? And look at the causation in this verse right here. Humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's an order here. You, you cannot resist the devil and watch him flee from you if you are not humbled, humbled and submitted before God. Uh, you do, that's not a place you want to, tr- you can't try that. It's not something that you can fake. Oh, I, I'm a Christian. I got saved a long time ago. I'm a Christian. Well, if you're not living submitted to God, you resisting the devil is not really going to work. Man, the, I remember in Acts, some dudes tried this, and it didn't work. You remember the seven sons of Sceva? Yeah, somebody say that with that. Seven sons of Sceva. Sceva. What a name. Sounds like it came right out of a rap song or something. Skeva, Seven sons of Skeva. 
he was a priest. They were going around, and here's what it, it says in Acts. They were trying to use the name of Jesus in their incantation. Like, that's not something that you try to do. And, and they're saying, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to telling this evil spirit to come out. And this evil spirit said, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you, Skeva boys? Who are you? So being submitted to God is not something that you just try. When I'm submitted to the Lord, I will resist the devil and he will flee from me. You come out of him in the name of Jesus. And guess what that evil spirit's going to see? They're going to see Jesus in you. If you're submitted to him. If Jesus is your Lord. And we're not just giving lip service to Jesus as Lord. No, Jesus is Lord of my life. He's Lord of my life. So this is very important. Very important. Are we submitted? Are we fully submitted to the lordship of Jesus in our life? If we are, we are going to resist the devil, and he will flee from us. The Amplified says he's going to run away in terror from us. That's how he reacts to the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, uh, let's go down to Luke chapter 7. We're going to read verses 1 through 10, and I'm going to read this uh, account from the Passion Translation. I love how it reads here. This, is, this has really become one of my... Uh, go to uh, just passages that I've been that I've been going back to. There's so much in here, and we're gonna we're gonna mine some things from it this morning. Um, but it's really good. So this is the the story of the Roman centurion, the centurion who uh, had a servant who he loved who was sick. And anyway, let's let's go through it. All right. It says after Jesus finished giving a revelation to the people on the hillside, he went on to Capernaum. There he found a Roman military captain who had a beloved servant he valued highly, and the servant was sick to the point of death. When the captain heard that Jesus was in the city, he sent some respected Jewish elders to plead with him to come and heal his dying servant. So they came to Jesus and told him, The Roman captain is a wonderful man. If anyone deserves to have a visit from you, it's him. Won't you please come to his home and heal his servant? For he loves the Jewish people, and he even built our meeting hall for us. Jesus started off with them, but on his way there, he was stopped by friends of the captain who gave this message. Master, don't bother to come to me in person, for I'm not good enough for you to enter my home. I'm not worthy enough to even come out to meet one like you. But if you would just release the manifestation of healing right where you are, I know that my young servant will be healed. Unlike you, I'm just an ordinary man, yet I understand the power of authority, and I see that authority operating through you. I have soldiers under me who obey my every command. I also have authorities over me whom I likewise obey. So, Master, just speak the word, and healing will flow. Jesus marveled at this. He turned around and said to the crowd who had followed him, Listen, everyone, never have I found even one among the people of God, a man like this, who believes so strongly in me. Jesus then spoke the healing word from a distance. When the man's friends returned to the home, they found the servant completely healed and doing fine. Man, Jesus, just speak the word and healing will flow. And there, there are so many good things in here. And I want to talk about this, just this first thing that I recognize here of how this man, he was a respected, he was a respected Roman captain. And that, I, don't, I think that was probably pretty rare in these days, pretty rare uh, among the Jews, and so he was friends with some Jewish elders, and so he sent them to Jesus uh, because I, the reason that he sent them to Jesus, he had heard something. He had heard about Jesus to this point, and he loved his servant, and so he sent these Jewish elders, and when the Jewish elders came to Jesus, he, he didn't give the Jewish elders words to say. You'll notice that in the second time that he sent his friends to Jesus, it was his words, Okay? In this first time, he didn't give the Jewish elders words to say, but here's what they said. If you can go back to verse 4, verse 4, look at what they said. He's a wonderful man, Jesus. If anyone deserves to have a visit from you, it's him. Won't you please come to his home and heal his servant? Look at verse 5 here, too. He also did, he loves the Jewish people. He even built a meeting hall for us. So these Jewish elders, they're approaching Jesus on this man's behalf based on his merits and what he's done, yeah. Right? And this is important because, I mean, up to this time, the, the Jews, they're following the law. That's how you approach God. You approach God based on how good you were at keeping his commands and following the law. This guy was pretty good. 
He did a good job, and that's how they were approaching Jesus. But when he sent his friends, as Jesus got closer to his house, here's, what he, here's the words that he gave his friends down in verse, um, verse 8. Wait, verse 6. Middle of verse 6. He sent, them, he sent some friends, and he, tell, he told them to say this, Master, don't bother to come to me in person, for I am not good enough for you to even enter my home. I'm not even worthy to come out and meet one like you. And so the Jewish elders, they approached him based on this man's merit. He, he approached Jesus based off of Jesus' merit and Jesus' goodness and who Jesus was. And this is something so important for us to remember. We cannot approach grace like we can earn it and we can deserve it. We, you can't do that. Grace doesn't work that way. And when I say grace, you know who I'm talking about? I'm talking about Jesus. The Bible says in, um, you, can, you can put it up there if you want, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If someone is full of something, they are that something. Jesus was full of grace. He was grace. And you do not, you do not receive grace based on what you did. That's not how we approach, that's not how we approach Jesus. In verse 17 of John 1, it says, The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Oh, my. I love this so much. Just to take a little tangent on, on grace right here. The law was given to a man. The law was given to Moses. And the law, if you read through, it never lifted a finger to help anyone fulfill the law, obey the law. All it did was it said, here's what it is. Live up to it or else. But it says, but grace and truth came in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came, and he was grace to us. Thank you, Lord. So he's showing us a new way here already. Before he's even going to the cross, he's showing us a new way. You don't, you don't approach me based on what you did. You can approach me based on who I am and my goodness and my love for you. Amen? Amen. Um, so uh, what the, one of the main things that I see in this story was that the Roman captain, the centurion, he deemed Jesus' word to be equal with Jesus. Okay, this is going to be really, we're going to spend a little moment on this right now. He deemed the word of Jesus to be the same as Jesus. He said, listen, you don't, you don't need to come to my home. You just stay where you're at because I, I know what authority looks like. I'm just an ordinary man, but I understand authority. It works like this. I've got people who work for me, I tell them what to do, and they do it. I work for someone else, and I listen to my superiors, and I obey, and I do what they tell me. I, I see that you're a man of authority too. And so you can just say the word from where you're at, and I know that healing will flow. And Jesus ended up calling this, this is what great faith looks like. You know that there were only two times in the Gospels where Jesus used the term great faith. Interestingly enough, both times it was a Gentile person, a Gentile person who approached Jesus based on who he was instead of what they did. Man, and Jesus used great faith because this man understood authority. And I think this is something that we've lacked in our understanding of authority. Jesus is called the Word of God, and I want us to look at these. I know, I know you know this. But Jesus is called the Word of God at the beginning of John. Go ahead and put up John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. It was with God, and the Word was God. If the Word was God, the Word still is God. Okay? And you can go all the way to Revelation, almost the very end of Revelation. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 13. John's right, and he says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Man, can y'all picture this? Picture it as we're reading. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Man, this isn't, his name is the Word of God. He is the Word. If Jesus showed up in person today and he was standing right here, 
a lot of our reactions and a lot of how we would perceive that is far different than we perceive this right here. And yet, Jesus himself would say, when you read in here, when you look in here, he would draw an equal sign in the air, and he would say, I equal this. Amen. This We are the same. Amen. It's the same. And we've lost a lot by thinking that we are submitted to the Lord, and Jesus is our Lord when we're not submitted to this and when this isn't having the final say in our life. The Bible, Jesus, is the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible that you have or that you should have is Jesus. It's Jesus. He and his word are the same. A person's word is only good in realms in which it holds authority. And so we saw this, the, the Roman officer was saying this, you know, people, I got, you know, my guys do what I tell them to. I do what I'm told to for my superiors. Why? Because they hold authority here. And so what he was inferring when he was talking to Jesus, he was inferring that, Jesus, you have authority over sickness. Is this not what he was inferring? He's saying, I know you're a man of authority, um, so you can just speak from where you're at, and this sickness in my servant will do what you tell it to do. You don't, even, you don't have to come close because I, don't, I can just send word to my guys and tell them what to do. The word will do the work. The word will do the work wherever it's sent from. But I know that this sickness, it has to submit to your authority. So just speak the word from where you're at and healing will flow to him. Healing will flow. Come on, this is, this is good. This is good news. Matthew 28, verse 18. Here's some other good news. Towards the end of Matthew, he says, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority, someone say all authority, all authority has been given to me um, in heaven and on earth. That pretty much covers it, right? Other translation will say, all the authority of the universe has been given to me. And then he, he, after this, he says, now, now what? You go and make disciples. And he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If he says, all authority and in heaven on earth has been given to me. Now you go in my name and make disciples, and I am with you always. Guess what you always have with you? You always have that same authority that Jesus walks in and that he carries. And it is our duty, it is our responsibility, and it is an honor to carry out the same authority that Jesus walked in. We are responsible to carry out the same authority that Jesus walked in. What He said, heal the sick. You, heal the sick. How? In the name of Jesus. In my name. In my name. And guess what? That's not going to happen if we're not fully submitted to this whole thing. All of it. I don't get to pick and choose what I'm going to submit to. I don't, I don't get to compartmentalize Jesus the person and say, I like all of you but your left arm. It's all of it. It's all of it. I'm only submitted to Jesus when I'm submitted to his word, the Holy Bible. Jesus and his word, they are the exact same, exact same. I think one of the, one of the things I picked up on here, and I didn't study this out a ton, but I imagine there's, there's some merit to it, there's something there, but I'd ask this question, can God's power be exercised before his authority is recognized? Can God's power be exercised in my life before I recognize fully his authority in my life. I would venture to say no, it couldn't. Until I fully submit to the authority, the, the word of God, his power can't be exercised in my life. Now, he can exercise his power um, without people recognizing his authority. That's going to happen one day when he says, uh, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So one day... Every knee, whether it wants to or not, is going to be forced to bend like this. And they will confess that Jesus is Lord. But guess what? His power at that point is not going to be working for them. It will be working against them. So for those of us who want to bend the knee early, then his power can work for you right now. Right? His power is for you right now if you're submitted to him. Man, and I think... This is the look in the mirror that we got to take. 
oh, I got to see just how fully is my knee bent right now. Is my knee all the way bent to him, or am I, am I balking some of the things that I'm seeing in there? Or, or I know it, and like Jesus was saying, he was like, you know, if you listen to the words that I say, but you don't apply them and you don't build your life on them, it's like building your house on the sand. How fully is my knee bent to the word of God? Here's a good litmus test. Is his power working in your life? Is your life looking like what he said it would look like? Jesus said to pray this way, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come. May your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Is, is heaven being reflected in your life right now? If not, I might need to look at how fully submitted I am to his word. So just a look in the mirror. Are you all good with this? I know this is a little bit, this is a challenging thing to me. This is the beauty of like when Pastor Nate gets to ask me to teach. Guess what I, guess what I teach, what the Lord's talking to me about. So you just get to see, man, Landon's looking in the mirror right now. I am. I want to know how submitted I am to him. I want, I, there needs to be God's power flowing in my life. Yes. Amen. Not just for me, but to be on display for others to see. Yes. The, time, the time is drawing near. Like People, people want Jesus. They, they, they may not even know what they want, but what they want is Jesus. That's why they're so responsive right now. And i got to have his power flowing in my life. I can't go another day without making God's word final authority in my life if I expect my days to be ordered and his power to flow in my life. Um, and then the final thing that, that I want to pull out from here, and this is really more just something that I noticed based off of something that was said. Uh, Pastor, you said this. I don't know. You might have been. And Pastor Nate says a lot of things, like walking down the halls in, the, in staff meetings. There's a lot, of, a lot of things that can be picked up on, so I don't know if it was in service or that, but, but it was this. It was, I, I won't have much of a faith problem when I'm interested. I just need to be more interested. So this is good right here because a lot of people get tripped up thinking that they need more faith. Oh, I need more faith to say healing will flow. You just need to be a little more interested is what you need. The Bible talks, you just, there's faith as a mustard seed. And if you had faith as a mustard seed, you could say to a mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, right? It's, it's faith. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a faith thing. It's how interested are you. And if you'll notice in your life when certain situations arise or when things come up, you're, in, you're more interested in faith at times rather than some other times. Is this true or not? There are times in your life where you're a little more spiritually heightened and aware, and you're like, I'm, I'm submitted to God's word, and I'm standing in faith, and I'm going to see, and I'm going to have what God said. And there's other times where it's like, things may be going okay. Things may be going okay, and there's not really that interest there like there was before. Man, I don't want to have a crisis in my life to be living by faith. The Bible tells us all over the place the scripture's all over. The just, the righteous, shall live by faith. I, don't, I, can't, I shouldn't just be summoning faith when I need it the most. I should be living by faith, living that way. That's how I'm to live. That's how you're called to live, is by faith. It's by faith. Um, so here's a question for you. What's something that I can be exercising my faith over right now in my life? You know, when we're just talking about what faith, faith is submitting and holding to God's word above all else. Where's an area, where's something in my life that I should, should be and can be exercising faith right now? So, for there to be order, I need to be submitted to God's word as final authority. This is where order starts. If you want order in your life, if, if you want to start making progress in the plan of God for your life, uh, you just want to see uh, yourself not just in a rut and seemingly going in circles, you want to make actual progress, it starts right here. I have to recognize God's word as final authority in my life. It makes the final call. Amen. Final word, period. Right? Okay. So, now let's talk about this. First things first. So, when we're talking about priority, that, that denotes this, this thing first. Right? If something's priority, it's first. That's priority, first. Priority boarding, first on. First on, okay? Which I never really get, but priority boarding. First. First. Let's look at Matthew 6, 33. 
If you're familiar with this, this is the only verse we're going to read out of it. But it says, seek what? First the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So we know the things he's talking about. Don't worry about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. Your father knows about these things, okay? He knows about them. Here's what you're going to do. Seek first the kingdom of God and all the things that you think about, that you're concerned about, he will add those to you. They'll be added to you. So first denotes an order. There's, and there's a principle of first uh, all throughout the Bible, if you've looked. And we're going to look at an example this morning. There's a principle of firsts, first. Let's look at the one here um, in Exodus chapter 13. Exodus 13, 1 and 2. We're going to read 1 and 2, and we're going to read some different scriptures here. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast. Say these last three words with me. It is mine. Whose is it? Whose is the first? It's the Lord's. It's his. He said, it is mine. And he's going to go into more detail about what that is, but... It's the Lord. So let's look at verses 11 through 13 and read about what he's talking about here. He said, And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers and gives it to you, that you shall set apart, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have. The males shall be the Lord's. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. You're going to have to kill that donkey. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on right here. Um, but he's saying every firstborn from, from your animals, you're to sacrifice it to the Lord so, so that you can redeem it. And when you have, you know, donkeys were considered unclean animals. Right, so when an unclean animal, uh, and I had to learn what a female. Anyone know what a female donkey is called? A jenny. That's right. I'm like jenny or something else. I'm like that's just a name, jenny. Okay, jenny. What's a male donkey called? Jack and Jenny. All right. Who? I mean, I learned animal stuff today. All right. Uh, a jenny. If you had a jenny, and that jenny gave birth to um, a male. Jack, I guess. I don't know. I'm just using names now. It's weird. All right. When your female donkey gives birth and it's a male donkey, guess what? That donkey is the Lord's, but it's unclean. You need to take a lamb, which is a clean animal, and you need to sacrifice that lamb to redeem the donkey. God, this is a, this is a picture of what Jesus did for us. You, you have to take the clean and sacrifice it to redeem the unclean. And so this is a type and shadow of, of what Jesus, of Jesus and us. Jesus was clean. By nature, we're born, we're unclean. Unclean. The clean had to be sacrificed to redeem the unclean. And this is the principle of the first. Jesus was the firstborn, the firstborn among the dead. He, I mean, you see this. Jesus was the first fruits, all right? And so you can do your own study on it. He was the first. And so this first thing is really, really important. God gave his first, his best, his only. Before there was any guarantee of a harvest. And this is what happens when that, when that um, female animal gives birth. And I don't know how donkeys, do donkeys give birth to litters? Probably not, just one, right? So when that Jenny gives birth to that one donkey, or, in the, or let's just talk about a clean animal. When a clean animal gives birth to that first male animal, and it has to be sacrificed because it's the Lord's, guess what? That They don't wait till they have other animals to do it. They take it right then, like when they're eight days old, and they sacrifice it to the Lord before there are any more that come after that. The clean, the clean animal. And so the first redeems the rest. This is the principle here. The first redeems all the rest. This is why we talk about the tithe as being so important. The first 10% of your increase redeems the rest. It redeems the rest. I would much rather have 90% of my income completely redeemed 
than 100% that's not redeemed at all by God and can't be blessed at all by God. This is why people say, I can't afford to tithe. You can't afford not to tithe. And the word afford doesn't even work there because here's what it is. Go back to verse 2 in Exodus, what we were just talking about. What did the Lord say? It is mine. That first is mine. That 10% was never yours to begin with. This is why he talks about in Malachi, you've been stealing from me. That was never yours to begin with. It's mine. It's mine, the Lord said. And the first will redeem the rest. I've seen this principle play out in my life over and over and over again. When you give God your first, he will redeem the rest. Every time. Every time. Amen? So talking about seeking first the kingdom of God and putting him first, I wonder, I wonder what would happen if I sacrificed the first part of my day to the Lord. Would it redeem the rest? And I, <laughs> I know we get into a lot of different things here, and I'm, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that this is just, I'm just saying there's a lot in the Bible. Jesus went away in the first part of the day. I'm saying this as a guy who's not always putting that Jesus time first in the morning. This is why this is for me right now. I'm asking myself that question. I wonder if I put Jesus, time with him, at the first part of my day, if the rest of my day would be redeemed then. I mean, I, I, can, see, I can see scripture for this here, right? And you, you may say, well, hey, my, my time with Jesus is during this time. That's awesome. That's amazing. If you have that time, here, here's the kicker. If, if you actually have that time and use that time for that. Because we like to say, this is my time for that. But the reality is, is that when something's at the first part of your day, you're more likely to do it than all the other crap that comes up throughout your day, and then you never get to it. And so there's a reason that it kind of keeps going back to the first part here. The first part. And here's where, here's where we talk about, well, you know, I, I'm just not a morning person. You know, I work 15 hours a day, and I've got seven kids under the age of seven, and, and you know, I've got this going on, and we've got t-ball practice, and then t-ball practice, and then t-ball practice, and then t-ball practice. And then uh, we've got that, and my wife has this, and the, my kid has this, and the other kid, the sixth kid has this, and I'm not really a morning person. That's not me. I'm not really that spend time with God, like, personality. That's not my personality. I'm not, I'm not an afternoon person or night person either. What person are you? <laughs> like, like what, uh, what person are we? I mean, listen, listen, listen to this. Listen, listen, I'm getting here. It's here somewhere. Listen. If you argue for your limitations, you get to keep them. If you want to if you want to keep arguing for your limitations, you can keep all of them. Man, this kicked me in the good place this week. I'm telling you, if if I want to keep arguing for what I'm not and what I can't and all that, guess what? I can stay right where I'm at. Man, at some point, we got to just take what God's word says and like, I'm going to submit to that and I'm going to do what he said. I'm going to do what he said and I'm going to have what he said I'd have. I'm going to have what he said I have. Is this helping you? If you argue for your limitations, you get to keep them. It's time that we embrace the power that we have to set our own darn schedules. Let's not pretend like someone else is in charge of our life. The person who's supposed to be in charge of our life, our Lord, probably wouldn't set our schedule the way that they're set right now. So I need to stop pretending that someone else has power over me to change what only I can change. Okay? I, I've got to say, listen, this is what's most important. Because if we... If we, and I was going to have some things on the screen just for visuals for you to see, but I think we can get there. I asked myself this question, is my life scheduled around what matters most? 
So is my life scheduled around what matters most? And I'm going to give you the answer to that question because I have it. The answer is yes. Your life is scheduled around what matters most to you. The answer is pretty easy, and it's yes. Now, the, the question that we thought we heard was, is my life scheduled around what I say matters most? That's the question we think we hear. Is my life scheduled around what I say matters most? So there's a gap. There's a gap between what we say matters most and what actually matters most. But the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in what I'm doing. The proof is in my schedule. The proof is in my checkbook. If God is first in my life, there is the proof of it in my life. And proof is something that people can see. People can see proof. And so there, there's that gap. And I'm admitting, like, there's a gap between what I say is important and what is really important. And for me, I don't know about for you, but for me, I want to start closing that gap. I want to close that gap because I want God to have first place in my life. I want him to have the first. I want him to have the best because I know and I've seen and I've tasted that he is good and he will redeem the rest. He'll redeem the rest. So instead of arguing for our limitations, here's what we're going to do. And we're going to put into practice something that we've been going over on Wednesday nights. We're going to read um, Romans 4.17 talking about the God who calls those things that are not as though they already were. This is from the NET version, the second half of it. It says, the God who makes the dead alive and summons things, the things that do not yet exist as though they already do. I love this word summons. You know what summons means? Order to appear. I'm ordering you to appear. This is what the word summons means. And it's high time that we started ordering the things of God to appear in our life rather than what we're seeing all the time. I know what my schedule looks like right now, but I'm going to start calling it something different. This is where the church has to become proficient at, at walking by faith. Living by faith means that I'm going to live and do what the Word of God says regardless of what I see, regardless of what people think. Because I know that to the eyes, it looks crazy. That guy is talking about doing things that he never does. But what I'm doing is I'm calling those things. I'm ordering th these things to appear in my life as though they already were. I'm talking like I already have something because that's what faith does. That's what faith is. That's how faith looks. So... I'm, I'm done arguing for my limitations about what I can do, what I can't do. I'm submitting to God's word as final authority in my life, and I'm giving God the first part. I'm giving him the first because he's going to redeem the rest. Let's stand this morning, and let's, let's summon some things together. You want to? We're going we're gonna to confess this together. It's going to take us a minute, but we're going to do it, and we're going to call those things that are not as though they already were. That's what we're going to do. Pastor, do you have anything after this? Okay. All right, are you all ready? Let's say this after me. Say, I'm a morning person. <laughs> Y'all sounded like you meant it, too. I'm a morning person who loves to spend time with God right when I get up. It doesn't look like it now, but I'm becoming a person who gives the Lord the first part of his day because I know he can redeem the rest. I'm fully submitted to the authority of his word, and it has the final say in my life. My life is getting in order as I by the grace of God, place him first and foremost in all I do. As a result, my life will bring increase to the kingdom of God. Amen. Let's thank him. Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we are having what your word says. We are calling those things that are not as though they were right now. We are operating just like you as it says in Romans. 
We're operating just like you. We're summoning, summoning those things to appear in our life. Your word. We're having what you say. And Lord, by the help of your Holy Spirit, we thank you for the grace to put you first in all that we do. Not just in word, but in deed. In what we do. In how we live. Thank you, Lord. For it's you who's working in us, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. And we thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, if there's someone out here who you haven't taken that first step, there's the the order that you're to have in your life and the lordship of Jesus. You have to be fully submitted. Until you make Jesus the Lord of your life, then you, you can't have any of what we talked about right now. And so I want to make sure that, that you've been able to make that decision. If there's anyone in here who needs to make Jesus the Lord of their life today, just let me see your hand, and we're going to pray together. We're going to pray, and we're going to uh, just see a miracle take place. A miracle, the best kind of miracle. It's the best kind. All right. Well, praise the Lord. God's good, isn't he? He's so good. And so just, just for you, as you're out and about, This is good practice, and there may be somebody watching online seven weeks from now who they want to give their life to the Lord. And here's how we do it. The Bible says that you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You you believe that he went to the cross and he died for your sins, and you confess him as Lord of your life. It's that simple, and you're saved. A miracle takes place, and what happens is you move. You may not have even known that you were in the kingdom of darkness, but you shift from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light and you are stamped and sealed with the Holy Spirit and you are his forever you had to spend eternity with him thank you Lord so let's just pray this together if there's anyone in here for those online Father God thank you for Jesus I believe you sent him to die for my sins Jesus thank you for paying the price for me I call you my Lord, I call you my Savior. Thank you for saving me. Make yourself so real to me so I can serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Well, this is gonna help us. God's word is final say in our lives. We're gonna have what he said. Amen. Amen. Hey, I want to encourage you this week. Easter's coming up. There's going to be people who are, who are, you know, sometimes we make, we make these jokes like, you know, you got those CEOs out there, those uh, Christmas and Easter only Christians, you know, but listen, God loves those people. We want to see those people. He's got something for them. There's people out there who may be even thinking, man, I haven't been to church in years man, I need to get to church, I need something. They're just waiting for someone to invite them. Don't underestimate the power of an invitation from you. Don't think, do not assume people's answers. Don't assume people's answers this week. Say, hey, you want to come to church with me this Easter? I'm telling you, they're ready and they're probably waiting for someone too. So let's be intentional about it this week and let's love on people and be ready for it. Amen? Amen. We love you guys. Y'all have a great week, and we will see you Wednesday night.